Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our wildfire prevention and response town hall. Thank you so much for joining this critical meeting. We are so grateful knowing how busy each and every one of you are. Uh, my name is Mike McGuire, and I'm honored to be able to represent Northern California in the California State Senate. Uh, let's just be candid. The North Coast, we have seen some of the most devastating impacts related to wildfire compared to any other region in the United States of America, which is why we wanted to be able to come together tonight to talk about how we can become prepared for this upcoming wildfire season. Wildfires here at home and across the Western United States, they're becoming larger, more destructive, and more intense. And tonight we're gonna to hear from some of the top, top experts here in California on climate and wildfire. We're gonna be hearing from Mary Small with the State Coastal Conservancy. We're grateful that she's with us tonight. We'll hear from Michael Wara. He is the director of the Climate and Energy Policy Institute at Stanford University and a proud Marin County resident. We're also gonna be hearing from two experienced CAL FIRE veterans tonight. Shauna Jones, she is the CAL FIRE unit chief in Sonoma, Lake and Napa counties, as well as Kurt McRae. He is the CAL FIRE chief representing Humboldt, Del Norte, and Western Trinity counties. And then we're gonna be going to the best part of tonight's town hall, hearing from each and every one of you. We're gonna be taking your questions, your comments live this evening. Feel free to email us now. We literally received hundreds of questions tonight, uh, but we wanna take your questions right now. Email us, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're taking your conversation, your comments, your questions, your criticisms right now senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. If you're watching us live via Facebook, simply drop your comment, your question into the chat and we'll get to those uh, comments as well. Look, uh, while California's climate has always been variable, the last couple of dec decades here in the Golden State, they've been some of the hottest on record. And it's obvious that these rising temperatures are making a bad situation even worse. Since the 1970s, Western state wildfire season has gone from 170 days per year to 222 today. The largest wildland fires in California history have all taken place since 2017. And as he, we're gonna hear from Mr. Wara this evening in just a few moments, the average number of acres that burned over the last 20 years on an annual basis here in the Golden State we averaged about 830,000 acres annually. Over the last four years, it's nearly doubled to 1.6 million acres annually. And last year, it was the worst on record. In fact, uh, California saw 4% of its land mass burn over 4 million acres. And the smoke generated from the fires on those 4 million acres, it, uh, it contained the equivalent of 28 million vehicles exhaust for a year. So we know that not only is it leaving a lasting impact in our communities and our forests, we're also seeing significant air pollution uh, by these massive megafires. And the lives of so many of our neighbors have been turned upside down. And that's why we're moving with speed here in California to change this narrative, to help make communities more fire safe. In the legislature, we have been working hand in hand with the governor to combat this crisis. And while we've made significant progress since 2015, we're doubling down this year. We'll approve a record $1.5 billion in wildfire prevention and response funding. Now, 536 million of that 1.5 billion, 536 million is already moving and we're getting it into the hands of locals, local cities and counties, fire districts and fire departments to be able to move on wildfire prevention efforts. And these funds, they're gonna put more boots on the ground with CAL FIRE. Thousands of acres of vegetation will be cleared. Millions of dead and dying trees will be removed and dozens of fire breaks in every corner of the North Coast, in every corner of the state of California, dozens of fire breaks will be constructed. And speaking of fire prevention, ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful to have Mary Small with us tonight. Now, Mary is the Deputy Executive Director of the State Coastal Conservancy. And I gotta tell you, you're gonna hear some challenging news tonight, just how challenging we believe fire season will be this year. But Mary, she's actually bringing good news. Uh, we were able to secure $12 million for the Coastal Conservancy. 
And that 12 million is gonna be put to work this fire season. They're gonna be awarding wildfire prevention grants uh, that will uh, impact this fire season. Uh, and we're grateful that Mary is with us tonight. She's gonna give us an overview of the $12 million in grant funding for wildfire prevention projects. And she's gonna be giving us the highlights of the different projects that will be secured and moved in the North Bay and the North Coast. So without further ado, let's welcome Ms. Small from the Coastal Conservancy uh, to tonight's town hall. Mary, you have some good news. You're moving quickly. You're moving with speed on this $12 million. Take it away, Mary. Great, thank you, Senator, and thank you um, to everyone for being here. Yeah, the, the funding was approved in the middle of April as part of this early action funding to really try and get projects on the ground uh, before fire season. Uh, for us, that's an incredibly quick turnaround. Our board will consider um, these projects on June 7th. And our goal is to have the first project start work in June. Um, all of them start work before August. As the Senator said, um, we will be awarding about $12 million all focused on vegetation management um, to reduce wildfire on public and protected lands. There'll be a total of 33 grants that we're giving from Humboldt down to San Diego. 15 of those grants are to local governments, to cities, to counties, to park districts, fire districts, local government entities. Four of the grants are going to tribes. Eight are going to nonprofit organizations, three to resource conservation districts, and three to different water agencies. Um, and then I will just go through the list. There's 15 projects uh, in the northern part of the state. Um, so starting in the north, uh, we're recommending a million dollar grant for um, forest health and fire resilience in the Prairie Creek watershed, um, Redwoods up in Humboldt County, a grant of $35,000 to the Hoopa Valley Tribe for defensible space projects. Uh, $75,000 to the Trinity Resource Conservation District to do vegetation management around Lewiston, $197,000 to the County of Mendocino to buy chipper equipment uh, to, to run a chipping program through, throughout the county, uh, about almost $300,000 to the Dry Creek Rancheria uh, to do vegetation treatment on their properties. 150,000 to the Sonoma Land Trust to do forest thinning and shaded fuel breaks on four of their reserves. $115,000 to Casadero Community Services District also to buy a chipper and equipment to run, um, run a, a crew uh, around Western Sonoma. 345,000 to Sonoma County Parks for shaded fuel breaks and grazing. Um, on Shiloh Ranch Regional Park and Taylor Mountain. I'm running to the list. 575,000 to Sonoma County Agriculture and Open Space District for work on the Saddle Mountain Open uh, Space Preserve. 209,000 to Wildlands Conservancy uh, for shaded fuel breaks uh, on the Jenner Headlands. Then uh, 277,000 first um, to Sonoma County Water District for work at Spring Lake Regional Park. Uh, we'll be funding land pause 150,000 to do fuels reduction um, on private properties that they help to manage. A second grant, we had announced the first grant, but a second grant for work on um, Fitch Mountain with the city of Healdsburg's fire department a grant to the Marin, to the Mill Valley Fire Department of 144,000 for work um, along Blythdale Ridge, and then a million dollar grant for um, Marin Water to do fields treatment on Mount Tamalpais, especially around some of their infrastructure. Um, so that's the, that's the list in the North Coast, and then there's 17 more projects stretching all the way down to San Diego. I know folks are really interested. This was a really quick turnaround. We only had two weeks for people to submit proposals to us. We will have a new request for proposals out this summer. Um, and so if folks want more information, they should email grants at SCC, State Coastal Conservancy, .ca .gov, and you can get on our, our email list. We um, can only give grants to nonprofits, tribes, and government entities. So for individual homeowners that are interested in doing work, they really need to connect up with a resource conservation district or with a program run by their local fire district. Um, 
as, as you heard from my list, there, there are definitely some fire districts that are running community chipper programs and we're happy to, to fund those kinds of um, those kinds of programs, but we would fund it through the fire district. I think that's that's all I have. Um, thanks for letting me be here tonight. No, absolutely. That's Mary Small. And just want to say thank you so much to Mary Small. She's the Deputy Executive Officer of the State Coastal Conservancy. Again, she just announced uh, just about $12 million worth of wildfire prevention grants that will be invested uh, from Humboldt, Del Norte County in the north, uh, all the way down the coast to Santa Barbara, Ventura, as well as Los Angeles counties, uh, and a significant investment, a significant investment here in the north coast. Uh, over a million dollars in Marin County, a few million dollars in Sonoma County, uh, critical projects in Mendocino and Humboldt counties, uh, dollars that are moving now so that we have an impact on this wildfire season. I just want to say thank you to the entire team at the State Coastal Conser Conservancy. Let's just be candid, Mary. You've been working literally night and day to be able to get these dollars out with these shovel-ready projects. We want to say thank you so much. Uh, Mary, you have to be exhausted but feel good that we're going to see an impact this fire season. Thank you. Yeah, we hope so. No, staff have worked a lot of a lot of nights and weekends. Yeah, thank you so much. That's Mary Small from the Coastal Conservancy. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're starting out with some good news. Uh, oh, about twelve million dollars worth of wildfire prevention grants that will start positively impacting the landscape here on the North Coast between the Golden Gate Bridge and the Oregon border. Now we want to talk about. Uh, wildfire conditions in California. And there's no one better than Michael Wara. Michael Wara is the director of the Climate and Energy Policy Institute at Stanford University. He's going to be providing this, uh, an overview of the changes California has seen in relation to climate and wildfire over the past several years. He's going to explain what, what's really driving mega fires in California and why now? What trends is he seeing? What are the top concerns that he, see, that he has? going forward. And then he's also going to be focused on strategies going forward. What can we implement to better prepare and prevent wildfires across the state and to mitigate the current conditions? Mr. Wara, we're grateful that you're with us here tonight. Uh, thank you so much. And I just want to say on a personal note, Mr. Wara left his son's Little League Championship game to be with us tonight. But the good news is, sir, they're up 3-1 or 4-1 in the third. That's right. They're still they're still doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Senator McGuire. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about you know sort of what we understand about what's driving the changes we're seeing in um, Northern California over the last five years. You know where where we've seen um, really a rapid intensification of uh, wildfire to, to, to totally unprecedented levels. And I think that the key thing to recognize in, in terms of what's going on is there, there are two factors that are very important in explaining what we're observing. One is accumulation of fuel. So the exclusion of fire, the exclusion of the natural fire regime um, from forests and wildlands in California that's led to a buildup of more fuel. Um, and then that combining with a warming climate um, that, that we're starting to observe is a really regular feature of life in California these days. I, I'm a fifth generation Californian. I grew up in San Francisco in the Sunset District in the fog, and you know it is a lot less foggy than it used to be. It's a lot warmer in the summer, and that's, that's part of what's going on as well. So um, in general, we've seen a rapid intensification over the last five years of, of wildfire in the state. Uh, Senator McGuire mentioned is the sort of changing average acres burned where we've moved from about 800,000 to about 1.6 million acres over the last five years. Um, we're also seeing a shift from smaller fires to these mega fires that have come to kind of dominate the headlines and, and, and dominate the work of the two uh, you know, fire chiefs that will follow me. We're also seeing a change in fire behavior from um, you know fires that were um, more able to, more amenable to suppression and traditional wildfire um, suppression techniques to fires that have, you know, really extreme fire behavior. You know, the, the fires up here that probably folks perhaps remember, the Tubbs fire, the glass uh, fire from last year, the car fire up in Redding that generated an EF3 tornado. You know, fires where life safety is pretty much all you can focus on. Um, and so what's driving those changes? Um, the I think the, um, as I said, um, you know, fuel accumulation. So, so why? Why are there more fuels? Well, 
First of all, you know, an important factor there is, is really, and it's important to recognize this, is the removal of Native Americans who burned, right? Native Americans in our part of the, our neck of the woods um, regularly practiced what they call cultural burning um, to, to reduce fuel loads and, and to create better habitat um, and better, better opportunities for foraging. And, and removal of Native Americans in the 1850s through the 70s removed an important source of good fire in our environment. And then, you know, very well-intentioned um, fire exclusion policies have also led to a real buildup of fuels um, that, 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 that has led to dangerous levels that, that might not be a concern except for the fact that now we're experiencing the effects of climate change. And probably the most important feature that, that wasn't necessarily predicted, but now we're, we're coming to recognize is very important, is that as, the, as Northern California has warmed, the air is a lot drier. And that means that moisture from plants is just being sucked up into the atmosphere at a much greater rates, leading to very dry fuels that are more um, susceptible to ignition and really catastrophic wildfire. Separately, and this is something that I think everyone in our neck of the woods has noticed, um, the we're having extended dry falls, right? The, the rain, the water year in California starts on October 1st. And the reason for that is it used to start raining in a regular way around October 1st, late September, early October. But these days, last five years, we've seen dry falls extend well into November and even December. And we've seen some of the largest fires occurring very late in the year because it's just not raining um, in the fall the way it used to. And that, that makes the fire conditions much more extreme and much more dangerous for the first responders that have to try to keep people out of harm's way and then ultimately contain the fire. The good news is that um, we can do things about the situation, and, and there are, and, and we're actually really, I think, taking a leadership role in the Western United States with what the legislature and the governor are doing to try to reduce risks. The key strategies um, that are really three, and, and I'm not going to speak too much about them. I'm going to leave this to the, the chiefs, but I would just mention that um, you know, reducing fuels is an important intervention um, that we can take, and that has benefits not just for people that live in the Wuhi or in the wildlands but also for urban residents that suffer from really you know, choking smoke that's causing significant morbidity and mortality, even in urbanized parts of California. We can build community fuel breaks, another thing that's, that's really happening um, and in a big way, um, unprecedented way. And we can harden our homes so that they're less susceptible to ignition. And we've learned a lot in the last two decades about how to do that. And there are well-known, accepted, proven methods for reducing the ignition from, from homes. So. We're in a tough spot, but there are things that we can do to make the situation safer, reduce risk for Californians, reduce risk for the first responders, and 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 find our way out of this situation. I and mean, I'll just stop there and, and let the chiefs take over. Thank you so much. That's Michael Wara. He is the director of the Climate and Energy Policy Institute at Stanford University. He's going to be taking your questions. The chiefs will be taking your questions. Ms. Small from the Coastal Concerns Conservancy will be taking your questions or comments. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us right now. We're uh, just looking at our big board. We're about a thousand strong, 956 folks strong right now, uh, watching all across the North Coast. And we welcome the conversation tonight. Email us with your questions, your comments, your concerns. Senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're taking your questions live tonight. Senator. Dot, uh, senator mcguire at senate.ca.gov. If you're watching us via Facebook, simply drop your question into the comment section and we'll pick it up there. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we heard from Michael Wara. He gave us an overview really of California, the West, why we're seeing these mega fires hit us. Now we want to go to the local level and hear from two incredible chiefs from Cal Fire. First and foremost, we're going to hear from the Cal Fire Chief for Humboldt, Del Norte, and Western Trinity Counties. His name is Kurt McRae. He's going to be talking to us about his career. How has fire behavior changed over the last few decades? What are the candidly disturbing trends that he's seen in the field? What are your top concerns going forward? And then he's also going to talk to us about how is Cal Fire adapting to this new normal that we're seeing. He's also going to talk about what the agency is doing different now compared to what they did 10 years ago. So let's turn the floor over to Chief McRae. Then we're going to hear from Chief Jones, and I'll give her an intro in just a bit. Uh, Mr. McRae, the floor is yours. If you could take yourself off of mute. 
Senator McGuire, uh, thank you very much for allowing Chief Jones and I to uh, be part of this discussion tonight. Um, so to start off with, um, I'd like to go over a few um, data figures um, that are pretty sobering with respect to our wildfire situation. Um, five of the six largest fires in California's recorded history were burning at the same time last year. 17 of the largest wildfires in California recorded history have occurred in the last 18 years. Three of the five most destructive wildfires in California's recorded history have occurred in the last four years, and three of the five deadliest fires have also occurred in the last four years. So um, the, the, the part of uh, what I like to explain is in my short career that started in 1987, um, the average acreage burned in California has increased 500%, five times of what it did in my short career. So that's my version of uh, what I've seen in my career. And, and it's certainly concerning um, with where we've come from and where we may be going. Um, a significant contributing factor um, with respect to the size of these fires and the acreage is burned is, is the forest health throughout California. And largely it's impacts from drought and secondary um, impacts from uh, disease and uh, insects. And that has been a significant contributing factor um, to our wildfires um, here in California as, Western, as well as the Western United States. So moving forward, the, the current situation as we've all uh, been aware of in the news is, is, is concerning, um, but for us in particular, looking at some specific elements um, our fuel moistures um, for live fuels, meaning living fuels, are drier than normal and they're peaking earlier, meaning um, they will start drying out sooner. Um, and our dead fuel moistures are well below average and in many cases they're at or exceeding record low values. So um, what I try to tell people is there's, an, there's, a, there's a problem right underneath our feet. And what I mean by that is the soil moisture at the deep soil depths um, that allows live vegetation to remain green um, and, and somewhat um, charged with water, um, those, are, those are incredibly dry. And, and that soil moisture is what gives our living vegetation the resiliency to wildfires and moderating the effects on fire behavior and spread. Um, so my concern isn't specifically in the next uh, two, maybe even three months, my concern, as Michael just indicated, is what happens when we get out into our fall, late summer and fall months, where we may be up to 150 or more days without any significant rainfall. Those conditions, as we've seen in the past few years, um, have exasperated and greatly enhanced fire activity, behavior, and spread. So the other concern um, that's going to be ongoing is the current drought we're in. Um, those impacts to our forest health is, is going to take a, a number of years to realize. So what are we doing to prepare? Um, we've been augmented funding to increase our staffing um, as well as um, our training. And so our peak staffing is going to be on uh, June 1st this year in Northern California. And um, that's about uh, three to four weeks ahead of uh, a normal year. So with respect to that, we're investing a great deal in technology to give us real-time data, remote sensing imagery, to advance that information to the field levels all the way to the executive levels of our department to make better informed decisions. Additionally, there's uh, funding for home hardening and um, in our aviation program, uh, we're transitioning to a new helicopter and we're acquiring uh, seven large air tankers to add to our existing fleet. Uh, we're also adding fire crews to um, our portfolio of um, personnel and resources. And in the long term, as well as some uh, short term projects mentioned by Mary, um, there is a great deal of investment going towards forest health, fire prevention and fuel reduction efforts. And I want to make no illusion here. Um, this is going to take time. This is going to take years to affect that fuel change and the fuel loading on a landscape level. But we've started that and, and there's a great journey ahead of us to accomplish that. So with respect to that, um, we've increased our public education and outreach program. Um, and, and specifically with the uh, uh, defensible space inspections by CAL FIRE personnel, as well as um, enhancing our outreaches through public service announcements, advertisements, and um, one of the best resources out there 
is the website readyforwildfire.org. It gives you a great deal about wildfire awareness, preparation and evacuation um, planning information. So I wanna leave this to uh, Chief Jones with, with my last comment. <laughs> this year, every one of us has a role to play in preventing wildfires and be, being prepared for wildfire. Every one of us, um, not just in CAL FIRE or our cooperating agencies, but all of our citizens of California um, need to be prepared for the year ahead of us. So Chief Jones, I'll leave that to you. Did, um, Chief Jones, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, you're gonna be talking about uh, really some tools that, that homeowners will have, right? Uh, to be able to protect themselves, protect their homes from wildfire. And then also uh, we're getting a lot of questions, Chief Jones, on wildfire prevention grants. I know you're gonna be covering those. And Chief, I just wanna say thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, Chief McRae, I think uh, I probably didn't need to be here today. You took it, everything. Um, so I'll just wanna highlight a couple things. Um, we talked about acreages and um, locally here in the Sonoma Lake Napa unit, um, I think it's really important for, you know, we've been talking a lot about acreage and how much is burned. Um, I also have some information from 2010 to 2014, approximately 200,000 acres burned in the six counties I'm responsible for. From 2015 to last year, 1.4 million acres burned. So we have more than uh, tripled the amount of acres that um, we've burned. Um, and as has been said here, fires get bigger, we need more resources. Uh, we uh, put more people in harm's way because the fire behavior is um, is unpredictable. And um, I know we've said it uh, un unprecedented. Uh, it's absolutely um, not something that we, um, you, you can't outrun the fire, you can't outdrive the fire. Um, so it's going fast. Last year, the LNU Lightning Complex did a 12 mile run, 150,000 acres. Uh, in less than one burn period. Crossed eight lanes of traffic um, on Highway 80, or Interstate 80, and um, six people unfortunately died and 1,491 structures um, were lost in that. So um, it's not getting any better. Um, I, uh, I am not a sugar coater kind of person. It could be the worst fire season ever, and we all need to be prepared. So um, a few things that I want to emphasize, and uh, Chief McRae mentioned it, is readyforwildfire.org. So um, a couple tools for all of us, defensible space. Um, we've talked that, it sounds like a common term. What defensible space is, is the bear, is the basically the section between your home and the vegetation. So um, it, it allows for firefighters to get in and protect your home um, it gives them uh, it gives your house a chance um, for a fire uh, to um, it, as it comes through your neighborhood uh, to protect protect your home so clearing vegetation clearing the weeds um, cleaning your gutters um, those are all things that are uh, very important in defensible space um, we also have um, some things for home hardening um, some places in our rural communities, homes still have the, uh, the wood shingles. Um, they're uh, really receptive to fire embers. Um, fire embers from other fires are probably one of the biggest threats that we have to our homes. So if you can um, do some things like uh, changing your eaves, putting in some fire resistant materials, um, doing some landscaping um, that has some fire resistant vegetation. All of these things that I'm mentioning right now are on readyforwildfire.org. There's also an app there that is super helpful for anyone who's into apps. You can walk around your home with this app on your phone and it's a, basically a checklist. Um, that provides you um, the ability to look for um, the things that you need to look for. Um, Chief McRae mentioned that um, our uh, defensible space inspectors are also out. Um, that is the same for the Sonoma Lake Napa unit. Um, we are working with county, um, with all the counties. Um, some have their own inspectors. So we're, we're working collaboratively um, to make sure that um, we're not duplicating efforts, but we're working together in all the different neighborhoods. So
So um, a couple other things that you can do as a landowner, ensure your address is visible from the street. This is super important. When we get a 911 call and we have a potential um, person trapped because of fire, we need to know where you're at. So um, that address is super important for us to find you. Um, it's going to be important if you live on a smaller driveway where maybe it's difficult for even your car to get up. Um, you want to clean some of that vegetation on either side, approximately 10 feet, so that we can put or bring in our equipment um, so that potentially we can defend your home. As, Ch as Senator McGuire indicated, um, there we, we have a lot to do, and you can be part of the solution. So help us help you by doing and providing some of your own defensible space so that it makes it more simple for us to come and defend your home. The reality is there is not enough engines, there never will be, for everyone to have an engine at their house for protection while wildland fire comes through. So you have to be prepared. You have to help us help you. So there are a couple things that you can do. Getting involved with fire safe councils locally, um, your neighborhood cleanup groups, there's chipping days that some of your counties, counties may have, the city programs. Um, even your local refuge may have um, cleanup days for yard cleanup days. So um, those things are all really important for you. Um, HOA groups have cleanup days. Um, uh, the Your um, resource conservation districts, being involved at the local level with your neighborhoods, rallying your neighbors together next door is a great opportunity for you to get folks together um, and start doing some vegetation management. So you need to be prepared ahead of fire season. So right now we are at the beginning of fire season. We've had quite a few fires um, and uh, we're there, there are more than we had last year. So I'm asking you, please, um, if you haven't started your defensible space, your vegetation management on your own property, please start that. But I want you to be aware of um, your surroundings and the weather. Um, so red flag warning alerts, please don't do any vegetation on red flag warning days. If you're doing clearing, if you're using mechanical um, uh, vegetation clearing tools, please make sure you do that before 10 a.m. and check the weather always. Um, so those are some of the things. Um, fires are inevitable and you need to be prepared in the event of evacuation. So uh, you need to prepare a bag. Be ready with your family, know where you're gonna go, have a plan ahead of time, um, prepare a bag that has your papers, your prescriptions, your photos, um, all of those things. Make sure your pets are nearby um, and know two ways out. Practice them with your family. Stay aware, um, some of your local counties um, have um, alert and warning systems. Uh, that you can sign up for so you know what may or may not be happening. Um, the um, incident uh, information on CAL FIRE's website, fire.ca.gov, is along with um, some other, you know, your local entities. So those are some of the things to prepare. And then I wanted to, uh, Mary did a great job starting out with grants. I kind of want to end it in with some grants. You got about so, one minute, Chief. Please go right ahead. Okay, perfect. So um, uh, grants, so there's um, two CAL FIRE grants, the Fire Prevention and the Forest Health uh, grants. Unfortunately, both closed for this round in May. Of, um, in May. Um, they, uh, the, the Forest Health grant um, is available to private uh, forest landowners, Native American tribes, nonprofit, fire safe councils, and land trust. Um, but, uh, and the acreage for that is about 800 acres. Now, landowner X, Y, and Z, if they wanted to, to get together with the fire safe council, um, that the minimum for that is 800 acres. So there are some things that you can do. And I know Senator McGuire is going to talk to you about, um, some more additional funding. Um, so that is one. Um, and then also fire prevention grants, and that's for hazardous, hazardous fuel reduction, uh, removal of dead and dying trees, 
and um, planning and education. So those unfortunately are both closed. However, um, information about both of those and all grants available for vegetation management are on www.grants.ca.gov. And that's kind of a one-stop shop. So um, that is really all I wanted to share and I am available for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chief Jones and Chief McRae. Thank you, Mr. Warren and Ms. Small. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you again to our Wildfire Preparedness and Prevention Town Hall. We're going to be taking your questions, your comments, your concerns right now. I will tell you, Emily and Sophia, who are working with us to be able to take your questions, you're sending a lot of them in. So thank you. Senator.McGuire at Senate.ca.gov. We're taking your questions, your comments uh, right now. Senator.McGuire at Senate.ca.gov. Let's get right into it. Beth asks, how much is available in grants this year from CAL FIRE. So as you just heard, these grants are built to move with speed this year. So there have been two different actions. Uh, first action, we've already moved on. 536 million going to uh, bring in 1,200 seasonal firefighters, for example, for CAL FIRE, plus to be able to fund two major grants that CAL FIRE has. 155 million for forest health, which looks at forest thinning, dead and dying tree removal, um, fire breaks, and the 125 million for the wildfire prevention grant fund that you just heard Chief Jones talked about. Now, they closed because CAL FIRE is moving with speed this year to be able to get these out as soon as possible. So we're working on a sl second slug of funding for grants and other fire prevention measures. So we've already moved with 536 million. We're now looking at another billion dollars, not just for grants, but also for fire, other fire prevention issues, uh, as well as fire response by June 30th. So we get that passed by June 30th, CAL FIRE would then be able to reopen the grant process as we would uh, put dollars back in for a second round this year unprecedented number of dollars that are moving, whether it's for wildfire response or wildfire prevention. Uh, and it's 100% partnership between Governor Newsom, uh, the State Senate and the Assembly. Beth, thank you so much for the question. All right, so let's uh, go to our next question. Um, and that is gonna be coming in from Ted. Ted asks, uh, are there any monies available to be able to help private landowners for grants? Yes, there are. We're going to go to Mary Small, but there is a string attached. You have to work with a nonprofit, an RCD. So Mary, talk to us about the Coastal Conservancy because you will work with private landowners, but it has to come under a nonprofit or a governmental entity. And then we can go to Chief Jones to talk about the CAL FIRE grants as well. But Mary Small, Coastal Conservancy. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, definitely some of our grants are, are going to perform work on private land. We're just limited in who we can actually grant money to. So we need a government entity, a resource conservation district, um, a nonprofit land trust, any nonprofit organization. We can grant the money to them, and then they can do the work on, on private lands. But um, private landowners would have to be working through, like a resource conservation district, or um, some of the grants I was talking about, you know, the the city or the county fire departments are doing work on um, on various people's property, but the grant our grant is going to the fire department itself. That's great. So again, it's like working with your local RCD, your fire district, to be able to get that application into the Coastal Conservancy. Let's go to Chief Jones. Very similar process, uh, right, Chief Jones, with Cal Fire. Absolutely, Mary uh, covered it greatly. Um, uh, it is, we need um, through the local RCD or the Fire Safe Council, a nonprofit organization, um, it, it can't be a private loan, landowner um, for the two grants that we mentioned. Yeah, so if you have, since I'm making this up, 50 people in a rural subdivision, 50 homes in a rural subdivision, uh, or you work and you have 12 homes in a rural subdivision, you can work with a nonprofit, with an RCD to be able to put a grant application in who will do the work on there. And candidly, it really helps protect these public funds and also uh, pro provides reporting capability back to be able to determine how many acres were cleared and the work done. So really grateful to both CAL FIRE as well as the Coastal Conservancy. All right, popular theme tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bob writes in from Santa Rosa. I live in Santa Rosa adjacent to Annadale State Park. What will be accomplished this year to reduce the fire risk 
of a fire in the park devastating our neighborhood. So Bob, some really good news. In addition to what CAL FIRE is moving, as well as what the Coastal Conservancy is moving, we're proposing to uh, provide $90 million, up to $90 million for state parks to do wildfire prevention within park boundaries. So uh, we know in Sonoma County, Marin County, Lake, Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, uh, we have more state parks in our region than anywhere else in the state of California. So those dollars can be put to work based off of those individual state park units. So for the first time, there's gonna be $90 million dedicated just to state parks and wildfire prevention funding. Uh, Bob, we'd be happy to follow up with you uh, to be able to determine how much is gonna be going uh, into Annadale that will ultimately be up uh, to the state park system. All right, let's go to uh, our next, uh, we're gonna go to Brent. Brent writes into uh, Mr. Wara to make sure is built in a safe way. So it's so I'd say certainly where people live matters. Putting people in safe places is a better idea than putting them in dangerous places where firefighters may have to risk their lives to protect life safety and homes. But but climate and fuels are really driving the intensification that we're seeing. And so talk to us, Mr. Wara, 30 seconds if you don't mind. So what does the next 20 years look like for California in the West? If you think that uh, climate is one of the main drivers, not the only, but one of the main drivers. What does our future look like? Well, I think, you know, there's a, we have a choice about what that future looks like. And, and the, the Chief McRae and, and, um, and uh, Chief Jones, you know, spoke about how it's going to take years to really make the kind of progress we need to make on, on fuels reduction. And I completely agree with them. This is a multi-year, this is a decade-long project. But if we do that, we can live in a world that has lower fire risk and where, where fire intensity is much reduced. Or we can kind of do, you know, decide not to do that, not to invest in our, in our, our, our landscapes. Um, and we're gonna have intensification of fire due to climate change. It's gonna make last season be a normal season instead of an extraordinary one within about 15 to 20 years based on what the climate models are suggesting right now. And is that trending ahead of where you thought we would be? Absolutely. I think, you know, even the, the fourth climate assessment, uh, you know, which was just a few years ago that the state conducted, really didn't foresee the, the level of intensification that we have observed. The, the, you know, the fires that we're seeing, like especially, you know, really intense fires like the Creek Fire in the Southern Sierra last year were things that, people expected to see, scientists expected to see maybe in 2100 rather than in 2020. But we're there and we need to deal with that. And the good news is we are, we're, we're stepping up and California really is. The key, I, I guess right now, I would suggest is we need to make sure that the federal government also steps up and really invests in the landscapes where they have control and they can really make a big difference too. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk about uh, the federal government here in just a bit. Uh, the vast majority of forest land in this state uh, owned by the federal or managed by the federal government, uh, and that has brought some significant challenges to California. We're going to get to that in just a bit. All right, but we got to talk about the super tanker. So uh, Chief Jones, Chief McRae, um, Northern California has come to love the super tanker. It has been the Calvary uh, each and every year, and there have been some real challenges with the super tanker. Recently, uh, it was reported that the super tanker's um, owners are going to cease operations. I'm just going to be candid. There are licensure issues that the organization had with the federal government, along with the FAA, that they didn't work out that brought on the uh, closure to this uh, uh, operation. But Let's talk about it. So if we don't see the super tanker this year, uh, CAL FIRE is absolutely adding to uh, its air attack fleet. And by the way, CAL FIRE now has the largest public air attack fleet in the world. Uh, you're going to be adding seven C-130s that we're going to be uh, transitioning from the Coast Guard to CAL FIRE. And you're also transitioning out 12 Vietnam era helicopters and replacing them with Black Hawk night fighting helicopters. Talk about this and how important is that cavalry in the sky? Let's uh, go to uh, Chief Jones and Chief McRae. Okay. Um, so in regards to the super tanker, it is one of the um, many assets that we have for aircraft. Um, Cal Fire has 60 
plus the new seven C-130s that we're transitioning over the next couple of years um, into our fleet. We are the largest um, owner of uh, fleet that we own and operate. So um, with helicopters, our air tankers, um, both small and large, uh, we are um, we are well suited. In addition, um, in the, the language um, for the last several years on the budget, we also have the ability for what we call exclusive use. Um, so it allows us to utilize um, aviation assets quickly to contract with them. And um, we call that a call when needed airship. Um, and we um, hire all of them that are absolutely available. It's a very lengthy list. And I believe we used every single one of them last year. So um, we are very lucky in that regard. Um, our um, S-70Is or the Blackhawks, um, we are transitioning uh, those copters um, into our fleet right now. Um, we have, I believe, four. Uh, the one for Sonoma Lake Napa unit um, stationed at Boggs will be here at the end of June. So we will have that in our fleet. Um, it uh, flies faster. It delivers a thousand gallons of water at a time. So much more than um, what we had before. So that um, brings a more uh, quick and efficient and effective um, um, aviation model to our existing system. So we are looking forward to that uh, very much so. Kurt, I'm thank sorry. So much. Uh, thank you so much, Chief Jones. Let's go to uh, Chief McRae from the Humble Del Nord Western Trinity Unit. Uh, thank you, I, I, and, and well explained by Chief Jones, but I'd like to put a perspective on, on our aircraft. Our, our aircraft um, are there to buy us time to get ground resources to the fire to affect containment and control of fires. So as Chief Jones, we, we have a, a pretty extensive uh, aviation fleet um, within CAL FIRE and an extension of that service through our um, contractors. So, so from, from my perspective, um, to me, the, the 747 is not what I would consider a, 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 a loss, a devastating loss to our abilities and effectiveness. Um, it's just one less tool we have in the box. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Jones, Chief McRae. Look, we love the super tanker. We really hope that it comes back. Uh, but again, we are moving with speed to be able to replace uh, the super tanker. Um, and we've been doing it prior to actually, we got the news that the super tanker won't be operational. Again, getting these seven C-130s. And then Cal Fire goes literally and looks to the rest of the nation. When additional aircraft is needed, we go and do a short-term lease on those aircraft, bring them into the state to be able to hit those fires. They could be MD-80s, they could be uh, propeller. I mean, you name it, we're, we'll bring it in. Uh, and let's talk about that because we got uh, our next question uh, coming in here from Jane. Jane wants to know, Chief McRae, can we use salt water to put out fires? Chief McRae. Um, yes, we can. We, we, we don't prefer to do that because of the impacts of salt water on, on the native vegetation. Um, but in, in times of absolute imminent peril for um, uh, life and property, especially, um, we will use that option. Um, there is exposure to our aircraft from the corrosiveness of salt water. So operationally, we, pre we prefer to avoid that um, for that reason alone. But in, in times of um, urgent need, um, we will utilize salt water, although not preferred. Uh, Chief McCray, we're gonna stick with you. Uh, Michael Wilson writes in today, what are the prime hazard zones in Del Norte County this season when it comes to wildland fires? The, the, the prime hazard zones, in my opinion, are, are the forested settings. Um, our large fuels, um, uh, the 100 hour, 1000 hour fuels uh, that are typically logs, stumps, um, they are at or near or they're, they're near or below record levels with respect to dryness. So the potential for that fire growth is, is, is extensive. And that extension also goes into our upper elevations with the, the vastly diminishing snowpacks we have in our higher elevations. Are there any specific areas in Del Norte that you have concerns with this year? Um, I, I'm sorry to report, um, most every part of Del Norte County, um, including the immediate coastal areas are, are a concern. We just, we have not received the rainfall and snowfall that, um, that we need to affect that resiliency in our vegetation. 
We're going to go to Shauna Jones. She is, thank you so much, Chief McRae. Shauna Jones is chief for the Sonoma Lake Napa unit. Uh, Debbie writes in, I've heard that we're beginning to see areas of previous fires in California that have smoldered through the winter due to the reduction in rainfall. Is this the case? If so, what can we do to stop the situation? So in our um, San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, um, the lightning fire complex that went through the same time as the LNU and SCU fires, um, the, um, the vegetation, the duff, um, the redwood area uh, was very thick. Um, they did not get the rainfall that they should have, um, just like the rest of us. And so um, there are smoldering, um, smoldering underneath that duff or um, stumps that didn't get the enough water interior on the fire. Um, so as the winds develop and it gets hotter and drier, then those, um, those fires will potentially start up again. So that could happen anywhere in any of our fires. Um, um, on a typical year after a fire, uh, even in the um, LNU lightning complex, um, even a month after we were getting interior burnings um, because uh, things we, it, it just happens that way because we didn't have enough water. Um, that's throughout the, it's, it's gonna happen. I don't. <laughs> it's, uh, look, you're just being honest, Chief Jones. So I, uh, Really appreciate that. All right, we're gonna stick with CAL FIRE. We're gonna go now to Chief McRae. We're doing a uh, lightning round of questions here. Uh, Art writes in tonight, uh, Chief McRae, how do wildfires get their names? So, so wildfires are assigned their names um, by our respective emergency command centers that initially dispatch the fire. So those names are typically associated with, with a nearby landmark um, to uh, at most times give a geographical reference to the fire through the, the, the name of the fire. So it could be uh, a creek, a road, a river, uh, a monument, et cetera, and that's how uh, it gets its name. Yes, that's correct. Okay, uh, we're gonna go back to Chief Jones. Uh, Carmen writes in, I live in a mobile home park. Mobile home parks have been completely leveled in recent fires. How can I protect my home in a mobile home park? Chief Jones, Cal Fire. So I would say that work with your mobile home park, um, uh, clear some vegetation, if you have vegetation or around your actual mobile home, um, if uh, clean any gutters, any kind of vegetation that's dead around your home, work in the mobile home park uh, and outside of the mobile home park. So if uh, you've got um, close proximity to other vegetation um, near a park or near other homeowners, work with um, fire safe councils, your city, um, your county to try to see if there's a possibility to mitigate that. But do your vegetation management, clear any kind of flammable materials away from your house. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. And um, if you remember that ready for wildfire.org, that could be the starting point for you uh, to assist you in mitigating any kind of fuels issues that you have around your home. That's Chief Jones from Cal Fire. We're now gonna go to the Humboldt uh, Del Norte Western Ch uh, Trinity Cal Fire Chief. That's Kurt McRae. Now, uh, Chief McRae, this uh, question is coming in from San Rafael, but it could be a, a scenario that any of us would see on the North Coast. Jane says, if a wildfire were to come through San Rafael and we had 10 minutes to get out, the entire county would already be on 101 and there would be no movement. Uh, there'd be no place to go except towards two crowded bridges. Now, Cal Fire and local authorities have really changed their philosophy on evacuations. Getting folks out earlier, versus waiting to the, the fire being on the doorstep. Uh, we've learned a lot since the Valley Fire, the Tub Fire, et cetera. Chief McRae, I know that it could be an inconvenience, but talk to us about the philosophy now of getting folks out early so we avoid those traffic jams uh, during uh, an impending wildfire. Chief. Preparation and, and early evacuations is, is critical to, to getting people out of harm's way. And you know, people recognize um, often way too late that the travel routes for egress, meaning uh, means of uh, driving away or evacuating an area 
become congested and, and sometimes stop completely because of the overwhelming traffic flow and volumes. So it's, it's critical that people pay attention to their surroundings, follow updates through um, the news um, and other media sources, as well as CAL FIRE and, and other uh, cooperating fire departments. And please don't take chances and, and hope that the fire will be contained. Be proactive, have your plan in place like Chief Jones suggested and leave early. Um, it is a game changer when we have to affect rescue and, and forfeit our perimeter control operations. Chief McRae from the Humboldt, Humboldt Del Norte unit. Uh, Chief Jones, we're gonna have you do a quick 30 second uh, response on this. You've seen a lot, you've learned a lot uh, over the years seeing these devastating mega fires. You're working closer with local authorities now to get folks out earlier, even yes. though it may be an inconvenience. You wanna touch on that in the South? Um, so um, as Chief McCray indicated, uh, we don't want you to wait. If you're uh, if there's smoke in the air and you're waiting for someone to tell you to evacuate and you're freaked out, you need to leave. Um, you need to leave right away. Um, what we noticed in the, on the Kincaid fire, we evacuated a, I can't even remember how many people we evacuated. The fact that they left early and followed our um, direction to leave early because um, in the, the whole river area in Sonoma County, there really is similar to the San Rafael. There's only one way in and one way out. And that was the decision point for us to make those evacuations early. So it's very important that homeowners don't wait. Um, they need to monitor, they need to be proactive and uh, listen to the advice of the law enforcement folks for the warnings. If you're in a warning, you should be already packed and ready to go and probably leave at that point. Don't wait for the order. Um, evacuations um, early is, was very helpful. As Chief McCray indicated, um, if we have to uh, spend our efforts on evacuations and safety of you, because it's public first, then your residents. So um, we have to spend our time on that. So we're not protecting your homes. We're getting you out because life safety is our number one priority. Thank Let's you. get, thank you so much, Chief Jones. Chief Jones uh, with the Sonoma Lake, um, Sonoma Lake Napa unit, very grateful for Chief Jones and Chief McCray from Cal Fire to be with us tonight. All right. Let's talk about the federal government for a moment. And I'm gonna do a little bit of an editorial, then I'm gonna to go to Mr. Wara, and obviously the chiefs can chime in here if they would like. Look, uh, about 56% of all the forest land across California is owned or managed by the federal government. Uh, over the last five years, the state of California has spent over a billion dollars, over a billion dollars on federal land, uh, on fire breaks, uh, dead and dying tree removal, uh, and much more needs to be done. And what we've seen as a trend over the last decade with the federal government, the United States Forest Service, more and more of the, the annual budget is going to fire suppression, which means less and less fire prevention is being advanced by the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, now, we're working uh, with the Biden administration, we being the state, to be able to get them to put additional dollars into California to help with forest thinning, dead and dying tree removal, advancing wild and fuel breaks. But Mr. Wara, I, I gotta be candid. Um, the feds are gonna have to step up like the state. Talk to us about that because the Sierra Nevada, in some areas in the coastal range, uh, they're a tinderbox and the feds need to do their damn job. Uh, but I wanna put words in your mouth, Mr. Wara, uh, take it away. Yeah, well, I think, you know, at the current rate, that the federal government is doing fuels management, they'll get through their backlog, you know, in hundreds of years, right? It, it's just inadequate. And I think they recognize the challenge. Cal Fire executed a memorandum of understanding with the Forest Service um, where they both expressed an intention to do 500,000 acres of fuel management per year. And I think if, if we can accomplish that on state and private lands and the federal government meets us there on the federal estate, we can make progress. But so far, you know, we really haven't seen that. And, and, and really it has to do with resources. How much money are we investing in kind of our natural capital, right? Our natural infrastructure that keeps us safe and, 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 and keeps our forests healthy. Um, and I'm hopeful that the Biden administration and new leadership at USDA um, and, and Vicki Christensen's continued leadership of the Forest Service is gonna lead to, you know, increased investment. But what I'd really like to see is a plan. Like, 
how do we move from the 50,000 acres a year that the Forest Service currently treats to the 500,000 acres a year they've said they want to treat and they really need to be need to be executing on? You know, what is the what is the glide path to getting there? And so far, we haven't seen that. I'm hopeful we will. Yeah, and I, I think my concern is, and I'm never going to uh, speak for Cal Fire. I'm never going to speak with uh, for Chief McRae, but I think one of the concerns that I saw uh, on the Mendocino Complex fire, I was. Uh, out with some county supervisors up in Trinity County uh, last year, uh, being able to see the absolute devastation, over a million acres in the Mendocino National Forest last year. It burned two years before that as well, uh, is that there also is inadequate resources, firefighters on the ground from the federal government. Um, it is thin um, and candidly, they rely on Cal Fire to do a lot of the job that the feds should be doing. I'm just being blunt and I'm not speaking for Cal Fire and Chief McRae may not want to comment on this and that's fine. But I, I think my bottom line is, regardless if you're a Republican or a Democrat, uh, we got to get the administration, again, Democratic Republican administrations to be able to step up. Um, California has uh, tens of thousands of, uh, tens of millions of acres of US forest land here in the state and it is a tinder block and it's threatening the future of this state if we're not treating it both uh, proactively through dead and dying tree removal. We got 120 million dead and dying trees in the Sierra Nevada as well as the coastal range. And they got to step up their game to be able to get enough firefighters into the forest service. And there's an issue with pay there as well. But um, Mr. Wara, do you want to comment on that? And I'll see if Chief McRae wants to step his toe into this issue. Uh, yeah. Mr. Wara. I just say, you know, there's a there's a bill moving through the Senate right now to try to up our game at the federal level on prescribed fire. But in the bill, it says that the upper limit on field treatment is going to be three million acres and that they're going to spend three hundred million dollars a year. That is less money at a national level than California is spending for one state, one fiftieth. And I think we really just need to be putting a B behind that number, you know, billions of dollars of spending on fuels treatment rather than hundreds of millions in order to really make progress. And I'm hopeful that, you know, that the, our senators and um, senators from other Western states are going to push to get that done and recognize that, you know, we need to we need to fund our firefighters better at the federal level. But we also need to fund risk reduction and really change the culture of the Forest Service to really focus on this issue and make it a, a, a center of excellence in what they do. And I think the agency wants to do that. They just haven't had the resources and 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 quite the right um, perspective to get the work done on the ground. That's Michael War, director of the Climate and Energy Policy Institute at Stanford University. Chief McRae, any comments on all issues of the federal government? Well, I'll, I'll share a little perspective from my part is is um, there are agreements specifically between uh, CAL FIRE and our federal partners that allow for the exchange of resources um, to, to help each other out. Um, but there's no question there, there's a um, there's a, a trend that uh, many federal fires um, approach um, state responsibility areas that CAL FIRE has primary jurisdiction over. And for example, the August complex, um, we were faced with uh, approximately 100 miles of fire front um, emerging from the federally protected areas into our state DPAs at a time when we had our hands full already. So um, that, that collaborative effort is essential. Um, but I believe, um, you know, Michael has pointed out some things that, that do need to be looked into and addressed. So um, with respect to that, um, I, I think uh, it's only fair to have the Forest Service um, respond to uh, to a question like that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief McRae. All right, we're getting a lot of comments and questions about PG&E this evening. So uh, I'm gonna wade into this along with Mr. Wara as well from Stanford University. Look, uh, I will be candid. Everyone knows I am not the biggest fan of this utility. I think America's largest utility, Pacific Gas and Electric, is also America's most dysfunctional utility as well. Uh, they have underinvested by billions of dollars to be able to modernize their equipment across the state, uh, to be able to perform vegetation management around their lines and poles. And candidly, Californians are paying the price. Uh, communities have been burned down, lives have been lost due to uh, the incompetence, especially of the men and women who are leading this organization. I have great respect for the tens of thousands of line men and women and all of those who are doing the work on a daily basis, but their board, their CEOs, their upper management, they've been dysfunctional. They've been focused on the bottom line versus uh, protecting their customers. Now, uh, we have to hold them accountable, which we're doing here in 
California. But here, here's the reality, and I want to look to Mr. Wara on this. Uh, in the early 2000s, they PG had less than 15 percent of their lines in high fire risk zones. Fast forward to 2019, uh, over half of their lines now are in high fire risk zones, Mr. Wara. Um, and in particular, 25,000 miles of, their, of lines are in high fire threat zones and 8,500 miles of line are in extremely high fire risk zones. And then the headline comes out a couple of weeks ago that PG&E cleared 1,800 miles of uh, line, brush around lines, but in the lowest risk zones. It's infuriating. So, Mr. Wara, talk to us about PG&E. The state is holding them accountable. $160 million fine came down, just went public today on PG&E. But talk to us, give us your thought on that utility. Well, I think, you know, what I'd say with respect to PG&E and fire risk is that, um, you know, the, the management decisions that were made in the past really led to us to the place where we are, right? Trying to maximize profits, cutting corners, also trying to keep rates low, um, you know, led to a lot of bad choices that came back to haunt us, you know, in Santa Rosa, in Paradise, and places all over the state. And um, I am hopeful that the utility is trying to right the ship, but it's also going to take time. And, and I think, as you pointed out, Senator McGuire, you know, so many of the overhead lines are in high risk areas um, and, and, and the zone that is high risk is growing because of you know, the factors that we talked about earlier. And so, you know, unfortunately, we're in a situation where power shutoffs are probably the most effective tool to prevent catastrophic wildfire that's caused by the utility. And that is um, a really difficult pill for all of us to swallow, given what has happened over the last several years. Um, but it's the reality. And so, you know, I, I didn't mention it in my, in my introductory remarks, but I think, you know, another aspect of the fire season that's coming and that we should be prepared for is power shutoffs in, in the high risk areas of, of, of California, including, you know, all the places that are on the, on the call tonight. And um, hopefully, you know, PG&E can execute those power shutoffs better. They are getting better at it. 2020 was better than 2019 for sure. But, um, you know, and they are getting more targeted but the area that is high risk and where, you know, the, the overhead lines are just a real threat to life safety is growing. And so um, it's going to take a long time to work our way out of this mess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the areas that we need to uh, come to grips with as well, there are, uh, we, we talked about the 25,000 miles in, of high fire risk, and then there's 8,500 miles in extremely high fire risk. And then there's uh, about 3,000 to 4,000 miles that are uh, some of the worst in the state. And PG&E is spending about $3 billion every year on vegetation management. Uh, I really think it's time to start taking a look at what are the one-time costs to be able to bury some of these lines and price it out against having to go back every three to six years to be able to do trimming around them. Because again, if we want to ultimately reduce the risk, it's burying those lines and not having them above ground. Uh, Mr. Wara, 30 seconds, then we're going to go back to our chiefs. Well, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's something we need to consider in the highest risk areas. I think th the other thing I would say is we need to hold PG&E to a very high standard in terms of getting much smarter about how they spend ratepayer dollars to reduce wildfire risk. And the Welfare Safety Division, which is this new part of the PUC that was created a couple of years ago by legislation, is, is, is doing that. And I think they are a tremendously effective organization, but these are big organizations and it is, it is taking too long um, and we need to keep pushing them. I think the, the good thing to say, and I, I would agree with you, that the, the folks that work for PG&E, the folks out in the field, in the trucks, you know, the IBEW 1245 members, they want to do the right thing. The last thing they want to do is see their infrastructure kill people. Their homes, um, right? Their hometowns destroyed. Yeah. 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 And, and so I think we do need to recognize that everyone, you know, within that organization out in the field is doing their very best right now. And, 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 I, and the people in management, I think, are trying their hardest too, right? They, they also recognize that 
they owe the state um, an enormous debt for the help that the state has provided, and and they have a responsibility to to provide their the electricity in a way that is safe. And they've they have failed, and they're trying to right the ship, but it's going to take time. Michael Warr, Stanford University. Thank you so much. We're going to go back to our Cal Fire chiefs. All right, lightning round, Chiefs. We got a lot of questions coming in for you. Let's start with Chief Jones. Chief Jones oversees the Sonoma Lake Napa unit for CAL FIRE. Um, this is coming in from Mr. Dunlap. Mr. Dunlap, Dunlap asked, uh, will there be any real-time decisions to allow the fire to burn itself out rather than spend massive resources on a less human harmful fire? So give us CAL FIRE's philosophy on putting fires out versus letting fires burn. Chief Jones. So uh, CAL FIRE does not manage land. We have very little of our own property. So our job is to put fires out um, as they come up. So our goal is uh, 10 acres or less. That is part of our mission uh, to ensure that fires go out quickly so that we can get resources back um, to their stations so we can respond to the next incident. Um, we are not um, forest managers. So that's where we differ from our forest management um, uh, counterparts. So uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time taking a fire that is a wildland fire um, and let it burn out. Um, a lot of our fires are in the wildland urban interface. So we have structures and people to consider. And so um, unless we're doing a uh, vegetation management, um, uh, you know, a broadcast burn that is a prescribed fire um, during non-wildland fire timeframes that is controlled. Um, we do not generally allow it to burn on its own. All right, Chief Jones, we're going to keep it with you. Does Cal Fire have a central fire command center? Uh, that's coming in from Leslie tonight. So we have um, what we call two geographical area coordination centers, one in the north, one at Redding, and one in the south in Riverside. And we also have a Sacramento command center. So the north half of the state is uh, we work with um, when we're needing aircraft, et cetera. Um, we make those orders to our Redding um, GAC, um, geographical um, area uh, coordination center. Um, and then the Southern people, uh, Southern resources do that um, as well for the South Ops. So North Ops and South Ops and Sacramento Command Center. They all work together to get all the resources that we need, uh, both um, in the unit or in the state, mutual aid, and then outside um, for other states nationally and elsewhere. All right, Chief Jones from the Napa Lake Sonoma unit. We're now gonna go to Chief McRae, Cal Fire, Humboldt, Del Norte, Western Trinity. Eve writes in tonight, to what height should trees close to a house be pruned? Chief McCray. Well, the, the, the intent of pruning trees um, around houses and, and in fuel breaks in general is to remove that fuel continuity um, from the ground to the upper parts of the trees um, called the crowns. And so that, um, that um, disruption of the fuel continuity can moderate fuel behavior and, and keep it on the ground. So the recommendation um, is um, anywhere from at least um, 12 to, to 20 feet to really affect um, a, a disruption in that fuel continuity. So let's keep with this theme here, Chief. So uh, if you take a look at eucalyptus trees, uh, uh, Robert writes in, do you recommend no longer planting eucalyptus trees? Let's talk about high fuel load trees, junipers, et cetera. Talk to us, what shouldn't you plant? We're getting several questions about wildfire safe trees, or is there such a thing anymore, Chief? Well, it, it, uh, with certainty, um, uh, fire resistant species um, uh, tend to uh, moderate fire behavior as, as well as prevent um, damages to homes um, and properties. So uh, species that was mentioned um, with respect to eucalyptus or juniper, um, those can be quite volatile and uh, drastically and adversely affect fire behavior. So with respect to that, um, it's, it's not um, my recommendation as a professional forester, as well as representing CAL FIRE, to uh, suggest anyone plants um, that type of vegetation um, near their homes or properties. Kurt McRae, CAL FIRE Unit Chief, uh, Humboldt, Del Norte, Western Trinity. We're now gonna go to Mary Small. 
from the Coastal Conservancy. We're going to ask each of our panelists to give us 30 second responses just because we're running out of time. All right, Ms. Small, Coastal Conservancy, we are getting a lot of questions about private landowners. How do they access grant funds? So tell us, uh, you're probably going to have a second slug of about 10 million coming this year. So how do private property owners access grant funds from the Coastal Conservancy? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we would have to give the grant to a fire district or a city or a county, a nonprofit organization, a resource conservation district. Um, so I think working with your fire safe council, working with your local government to try and pull together a grant application um, would be the best way for private landowners or resource conservation districts, sort of whoever you think would be able to help work in your neighborhood or on your land, that would be the best way to get a grant from us. That's Mary Small, Coastal Conservancy, Chief Jones. I know you've answered this before, but I got it. We have 15 questions that have come in from private landowners tonight. Folks are coming in and out. We're still about 800 strong right now. So tell us, Chief Jones, how do private property owners qualify for grant funds. You're going to have to work with a nonprofit or a government agency, correct? That is correct. An RCD, a Fire Safe Council, um, uh, those are the folks that you should be working with in your local community. Um, so landowners, individual landowners can work together with those fire, fire safe councils and RCDs to apply for grants. Um, if they do not, your properties do not have to be contiguous, but it uh, needs to be at least 800 acres or more. All right, we're gonna to go to Chief McRae from Cal Fire. Uh, Claire writes in, is the retardant drop from Cal Fire planes toxic for the environment? Um, no, in essence, it's not. And, and the, the purpose of the retardant is, is to minimize and moderate fire behavior. And, and as I said earlier, um, and I maybe may not made it clear, uh, retardant and water from aircraft, um, we don't count on that to put out fires. It just buys us time to get to that. But we do have practices in place to avoid um, uh, sensitive areas such as riparian areas, um, cultural areas um, where we know about them. Um, but the, the effect of retardant, um, we don't consider toxic, um, but we do try to um, be a little um, discreet in where, where it's placed and delivered with respect to natural resources as well as um, property and um, water sources. We're doing our lightning round questions uh, for our panelists and we're grateful. We have all star panelists with us tonight. Chief McRae and Chief Jones are gonna ask you to chime in. Chief McRae, take first stab at this. Tony writes in, what discussions are happening, if any, about building regulations, restrictions, uh, about building in the urban wildland interface to mitigate risks for future fires? Chief McRae, then Chief Jones. Well, that's a great question. And right now the Board of Forestry um, that uh, gives uh, CAL FIRE direction is undergoing um, uh, modifications of fire safe regulations with respect to um, uh, uh, fire safe um, regulations. So that is ongoing. Um, most of counties have provided input um, because it affects their planning processes in uh, state responsibility areas. So um, I encourage everyone to follow the Board of Forestry on their website, um, uh, watch their uh, watch and attend in their meetings. Um, and if, if desired, um, please provide public comment to the Board of Forestry with, with each person's thoughts. Chief Jones. So just to add to that, um, the public comment is open to, I believe, the middle of June. So um, the... Um, fast uh, to be looking at that and providing public comment would be really important as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Chief Jones, Chief McRae. Right, this is coming in from Michael Wara. Uh, Mr. Wara, what do you mean by house hardening, number one? And number two, what do we need to do to harden communities? Uh, and that is coming in from Rebecca. Well, Home hardening, um, I think, was was well discussed by the chiefs earlier. It, you know, it involves making the outside of your house resistant to ignition, and probably the you know the most important thing that people can do is make sure they have a roof that's and, and siding that's not flammable. But even easier than that 
is just make sure that there aren't lots of, there isn't lots of flammable material sitting next to your house. Cause what's going to happen in a bad wildfire is embers are going to blow into your house. They're going to fall down at the base of your house. If there's flammable material sitting at the base that, you know, it could be dried dry shrubs. It could be a wood pile that's going to ignite and then ignite your house. And so taking steps to reduce the ignite, the, the, the flammability of the outside of your house is a really important step. Defensible space is important too. Um, in terms of community level protection, we really need to be thinking about reducing fuel loads around communities, adjacent to communities, and also building fuel breaks, which are you know kind of areas where uh, that's going to slow down fire behavior, um, reduce it, maybe allow firefighters an area to stage um, suppression resources to protect communities, to, to keep fire from getting into communities. Um, and, and that's that's really what community level protection looks like. And that's really the only way we're going to see significant differences going neighborhoods by neighborhoods, community by community to be able to get those hardening initiatives uh, implemented, correct? Yeah, and, and I just say, you know, there's really herd immunity. The evidence from the last few years is that, you know, it matters not just that your home is hardened, but also that your neighbors is, right? Because their home, if it catches fire, it's liable to light your house on fire. And so this really is a community level issue. We all need to do our part. And we need to recognize that helping helping uh, neighbors, to, you know, to, to understand what they can do is as important as doing it right around your own house. Four final questions. That's Michael Warr from Stanford University. Thank you, Mr. Warr. Four final questions. Next, going to Mary Small. Uh, Scott asks: Are tribes eligible? Uh, are California tribes eligible for Coastal Conservancy funding? Yes, they are. And how about for Cal Fire? Yes, they are. All right, and then the other important piece is uh, California tribes will have their own allocation this year as well, in addition to applying for CAL FIRE, in addition to, to applying for the Coastal Conservancy. For the first time ever, there'll be a $20 million uh, allocation just for tribal uh, fire departments and resource departments to be able to access as well, which is really critical. All right, lightning round, here we go. This one is coming to uh, Chief Jones. Julie writes in, what is the lead source of information one should go to first when a fire is happening? Nixel, police, CAL FIRE, who should I follow? So um, I'm, I can't answer that completely. So your local county, um, so I'll use Sonoma County, SoCo Alert uh, would be a one-stop shop. They have a link to CAL FIRE's website. So if you don't live in Sonoma County or one of the counties that has their own alert system, fire.ca.gov. Um, is your one-stop shop. It has the incident information um, regarding everything statewide, including a public information number for the local area that you can call if you have questions about evacuations, et cetera. Uh, it's Chief Jones, Chief McRae, let's talk about controlled burns, prescribed burns. What role does prescribed burns have in limiting wild and fires in California? That's coming in uh, from Hanson tonight. It, it has a significant um, a, a significant part in minimizing the impacts of wildfire. And CAL FIRE, as well as many cooperators and um, uh, uh, prescribed burn associations that are emerging in the state um, are affecting a greater capacity and effect um, with if, um, providing more broadcast burning. And that's part of that toolkit that we need to get back um, good fire on the landscape with respect to fuel reduction and, and forest, um, forest resiliency. Prescribed fire is the most cost-effective, efficient forest management tool there is in the toolbox. So it absolutely needs to be utilized much more. All right, let's stick with you, Chief McRae. This is coming in from Dana. With lakes and ponds so low, how will it impact aerial water drops this fire season? Thank you, Dana, for your question. Well, that's a good that's a good question that, that's obviously concerning us with um, river and lake levels uh, as well as ponds. So um, our helicopters, our, uh, our older helicopters are equipped with buckets. Some of those actually have snorkels on the side of buckets to draft from very shallow locations. Um, and then uh, many of our uh, contract helicopters we use um, have a snorkel capacity that simply allows a very um, relatively small hose to draft water while the helicopter hovers. But without a doubt, um, for fire engines, water tenders, and aircraft, water supplies are going to be critical this year. And conservation of water is, is a critical component of maintaining as much water as we can. Great question. 
Chief Jones, any comment on this? Um, so in addition, um, the helicopters have the ability, we have something called portable dip tanks. So we can use water tenders to fill portable dip, dip tanks where, um, as Chief McRae indicated, um, so if a water source is dried up, we can truck water in and utilize that for um, our helicopters as well. But keep in mind, we don't always use water. Our tankers use retardant, um, as Chief McCray talked about. And so uh, we use both water and retardant as part of our toolkit, um, along with our ground resources to put fires out. Last two questions, Chief Jones, let's stick with you. Terry writes in, what should I do if I'm stuck behind a fire line and can't evacuate? Wow. Um, well, I would seek, um, hopefully you have a phone with you, try to take refuge in an area, um, be aware of your surroundings. Um, you, uh, I would hope that you could get out quickly, but you really need to um, find refuge the best you can and be mobile um, because as the fire goes past, um, you're going to need to get into the black um, and get out of the green. Um, so um, that's, uh, it's gonna be a smoky situation um, and uh, you need to be mobile as best you can. Multiple questions uh, coming in on the issues of where you're most concerned, Chief Jones, uh, in the North Coast for wild and fire this year. Same thing with Chief McRae. So let's end it with this. Where uh, are you gonna be really focused on this year? Obviously concern all throughout because of dry fuel conditions and the drought. Where are you most concerned in your territory, Chief Jones? So um, as I said in the very beginning, uh, 1.4 million acres have burned over the last five years. Um, and it is the sad part is that we're seeing a lot of reburn of the same areas. So on the cusp of the Kincaid versus the Tubbs, the county fire um, was reburned in the LNU Lightning Complex. So I would have to say in brief, the entire six counties I am uh, responsible for all of it is receptive. We are in extreme drought conditions and everything is a receptive fuel bed right now. All right, we gotta stay alert in particular, stay vigilant. Uh, Chief McRae, uh, where are you most concerned about? Forested settings. It's those heavy fuels that are extremely dry right now where we're gonna have the most difficulty putting a fire out. All right, that's our wildfire prevention response town hall bringing together this all-star panel. We're gonna give each representative 30 seconds to be able to close here tonight with closing comments. We're gonna start with Mr. Wara, closing comment, please. Well, I just say we're, we're headed into what looks, you know, everything that we can predict about this fire season makes it look very dangerous. And there's still some luck we could have where things could turn out better than we expect. I hope we get that luck. I hope for the sake of the firefighters that are on the, on the call tonight and all of their employees that we get that luck. But I think the thing that to focus on is that there's lots that we can do to prepare to make this problem better. And, and, and I would just second what Chief McRae said that prescribed fire is the way out of this. We need to put good fire on the ground and really change the culture in California to make it okay and, and, and everyone's responsibility to maintain fuels more responsibly on the lands that they own. No, thank you, Mr. Wara. Senator Dodd has a really good bill that would uh, help ease some of the regulations around prescribed burning. Uh, we got a question, Mr. Wara, about your son's Little League game. Um, Robert writes in, what's the score? So, uh, last one. Time, all right. So we do, we just heard from Mr. Wara in the beginning that it was 3-1. Tell us what the, the verdict was. Six, six to two, Mariners advance. So, you know, we go, we live to fight another day. All right. Thanks for the question. Me. Mr. Wara right there. There we go. Robert uh, was listening intently, so that is good stuff. Uh, congrats, sir, and please give him uh, our best as well. Chief I Jones, uh, closing comments, please. So um, very briefly, uh, be prepared. Um, we uh, didn't sugarcoat it tonight. It's probably going to be a very bad fire season, um, heavy drought. Uh, be prepared. Have a plan. Please evacuate when we ask you to do. Um, if you're not feeling safe, leave and, and do ex, expedite your, your evacuation. Um, readyforwildfire.org. Um, that is a one-stop shop for you. Uh, please go there, review your plans of, for your house, for defensible space, your home hardening, evacuation, and what you need to do when you return um, from, uh, in, um, from evacuation. Be safe, everyone. Um, I hope that it's a, a good year, but we're preparing for a bad one.
Can't say thank you enough to Chief Jones for her incredible work each and every year. She has had a hell of a job uh, in her unit in particular. Uh, let's go to Mary Small for the Coastal Conservancy. Closing comments, please. Sure, well, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this. I think we're really excited to do a very small part in trying to accelerate the vegetation management that needs to happen. And I just wanna thank the fire chief um, in advance because we are so grateful in the state of California for the work you do. And I, I really hope it's not as bad as, as we fear, um, but, but thank you. Mary Small, we're grateful to you, to your team for getting that money out quickly. Uh, that's gonna make a big difference. Thank you so much. And Chief McRae, please, closing comments. Well, we don't have control over the weather, but we do have control over our actions and our activities. And it's imperative that everyone plays their part in being fire safe, prepared, and aware. And one real quick go back um, with respect to PG&E. Um, I view PG&E as a cooperator. The men and women out in the field provide essential life safety services to first responders in all types of emergencies, not just wildfires. So I'm indebted to their uh, services to keeping all of us safe. Yeah, the men yeah. and women uh, who are the heart of pg &E are fantastic. They do great work every day. We just wish their board and uh, CEO level management would uh, have an eye out for uh, the customers just as they have an eye out for their shareholders. So thank you, Chief McCray. I'm really glad that you said that because really good point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're so grateful that you joined us here tonight. We want to say thank you to our panelists, Chief Jones, Chief McCray, Mr. Wara, and Ms. Small uh, for being with us and for their incredible dedication to the state of California. We want to say thank you to our team who really helped put tonight together. Carrie, thank you so much. And Emily, uh, as well as Sophia, thank you for all of your work. I couldn't do this without you. Uh, and I want to assure you, the state of California is moving with speed. Uh, we know that uh, the times are urgent. That's why we're going to invest $1.5 billion. We've never invested this much money in fire response and prevention uh, in modern history here in the state of California in one year. 1.5 billion will be moving in wildfire prevention and response. $536 million uh, have already been allocated this year. The North Coast is gonna need every penny, every penny in that to be able to keep our community safe. Finally, I just wanna say thank you to Cal Fire. Look, uh, they have had a hell of a decade. Uh, the men and women at Cal Fire sometimes are out on the road for 60 days. Uh, sometimes 90 days uh, away from their families. We owe them a debt of gratitude. Uh, they travel this state up and down in every corner of California, uh, protecting our communities. They uh, have service in their blood and we're grateful for their hard work. We wanna say thank you to Chief Jones and Chief McRae, uh, Chief Gonzalez and Mendocino as well, Chief Weber, who was the Marin County Fire Chief, you're a contract county, not Cal Fire, but we're grateful to their work as well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing us to work with you in the state Senate. Stay strong, and I promise you, we're gonna work hard to make sure that we continue to secure resources to help keep our communities fire safe. Have a great evening. Look forward to working with you in the months to come. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Good night. Thank you.